focus on the liquidation and distribution accounts. Ladies and gentlemen, some notes were sent through earlier today. Um, can we all make sure we have those notes in front of us? I'm sure it was put on um, the e-leader platform or on Telegram or WhatsApp groups. So if we can please open those notes, you'll see it was two separate documents. I'm referring to the 10-page document, the one that starts with tips with liquidation account. Those are the notes we need to be focusing on for the purpose of this evening's lecture. I would assume that we all have those notes in front of us and that we're able to proceed. So what I would like to do with, uh, with all of you is go through the, well, five specific accounts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, we say liquidation and distribution account. Um, however, a liquidation and distribution account consists of a number of different accounts. I mean, it consists of a liquidation account, a distribution account, a, a state duty account, a recapitulation account, an income and expenditure account. Those are the five main accounts. I mean, there's even a fiduciary uh, account that deals with sort of fit um that one can talk about as well. So we need to understand the purpose of each account. Now, just to mention from the get-go, if you look through your notes, I drafted sort of like a basic pro forma type of liquidation distribution account. This is just for purposes of illustration. Look, there's no point copying and pasting what you see over here because, I mean, this account was drafted without a question on the top. Um, uh, so everything put down here is purely made up, but it's there so I'm able to go through it with you and explain why we do certain things. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we speak of the liquidation account, we speak of the longest account. When we speak of estate duty account, we speak of the most difficult account. And then uh, the distribution, recapitulation, income and expenditure is, is far easier compared to the other two. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's very, very important that uh, we study how to draft the liquidation and distribution account. Um, ultimately, in hindsight, if you know how to draft a liquidation distribution account, you're able to actually answer a question on the liquidation distribution account. So it is study work. But uh, let's try and make sense of this account. Now, let us start off with the liquidation account. So the purpose of the liquidation account is to, is to determine the net value of the deceased estate. Now, in order to talk about the net value, one will need to figure out what is the total assets in the deceased estate. And we need to minus from the total assets liabilities and estate duty in order to get the net value. We call the net value balance available for distribution. I want us to keep in mind that um, the hierarchy in terms of who's entitled to a claim. We have our creditors and then we have marriage, legatees and heirs. All right, creditors, marriage, legatees and heirs. So in our liquidation account, what we are trying to do is we are trying to minus our creditors from our assets to see what is left in order to distribute for marriage, legacies, and heirs. All right, so our focus here is in order to obtain the net value. We call that a balance available for distribution. So the sum starts off with determining what are the assets in the liquidation account. Ladies and gentlemen, when we have to record the assets of the deceased person, we divide it into three categories. We divide it into immovable property, movable property, as well as claims in favor. I'll say that again. Assets consist of immovable property, movable property, as well as claims in favor. Now, in order to, well, when we draft our assets in our liquidation account, that takes a bit of time because we have to properly describe our assets. So it's, it's more, you know, study work on how to describe an asset, and then we record the figure that's given to us as per the exam. Um, Question. Now, you'll see on the very first page, I said there are tips with the liquidation accounts. And I think it's important that we talk about these tips before we even look at how we drafted the liquidation account. Now, keep in mind, please, 
the tips I might explain it to you and it might not make any sense at this stage. But keep in mind what I'm telling you um, and what these tips are saying, because you will see as we go through the liquidation account, it will start to make more and more sense. So if we have a look at the tips, it says on top, if you see the assets, in other words, if it has not been sold for cash and is not cash, then it is awarded. If an asset is sold for cash, then it is realized. If an asset is already cash, then it is collected. So when we describe assets, when we mention an asset, we first have to describe it. When we're done describing it, we now need to determine whether we're going to award this asset, realize this asset, or collect this asset. We have to make that distinction on every asset we record in the liquidation account. So why do we award an asset? Whenever you see an asset as being a physical thing that we can touch, in other words, it is not cash, the rule is you have to award it. Right. So let us say I tell you, you have a house valued at two million rand that's standing over there or a car valued at 100,000 rand that's standing over there. That's a house or it's a car or it's furniture. It's things that are in existence. It is there. I can see it. I can touch it. It is not cash. Right. When we see such a thing, it means we must award the asset. If you move on, it says if we sell an asset for cash, then it is realized. OK, so if I told you that car you had over there was sold by the executor for cash, then we can no longer award that asset. We then finish off our description by saying realized. Thirdly, if an asset is already cash, then it is collected. So if I told you there is 50,000 Rand um, in the deceased person's bank account, now that's 50,000 Rand cash that's lying there. That is not a car or a house or an asset we can see. It wasn't something that was sold for cash. It is cash that was already there when the deceased passed away. For example, bank accounts or policies that pay out when you pass away. Any asset that is in cash form, right, that is already cash when you take over the state, we refer to it as being collected. So we collect cash, we realize assets, we sell for cash, and we award assets that has not been turned into cash. Now, just to illustrate this, um, if you go to the next uh, star, it says there, when the question says that an asset is worth X amount, but that the asset was sold for X amount, use the sold for the realized price. Okay, now that's very important, ladies and gentlemen. If I had to tell you that, listen, when you die, you the deceased estate had a BMW X3, all right? And that X3 was valued at 150,000 Rand. But what happened was the executor went and sold that BMW X3 for cash. And they got a payment of, let's call it 160,000 Rand for it. Now, the question is, when we go and record our BMW X3 in our liquidation account, do we indicate the value, what the vehicle was, or do we indicate the price we received for the vehicle? Now, I'm sure you would agree to me. If I wrote the BMW X3 150,000 Rand, I would be lying. Because in actual fact, I sold that BM and I got 160,000 Rand for it. So if I put 150,000 there, what am I doing with the other 10,000 Rand, in other words? So what I'm trying to illustrate is someone says an asset was turned into cash because it was sold for cash, we always use that cash value, all right? That is our realized amount. And then the final star on this page it says, when the question says that you have X amount in the bank upon date of death, and then goes on to say that after date of death, the amount in the bank changes, then the date of death value is for the liquidation account. And the difference that accumulated after date of death is for the income and expenditure account. So that might be jumping a bit ahead, but we'll still come to the income and expenditure account and discuss it. But just in short, that account deals with um, money made or money lost by the estate after date of death. So when we speak of our liquidation account, we speak of the value of the deceased person's estate on date of death. So if I told you the deceased person had 50,000 Rand in their bank account, they died on 15 January 2022 with 15,000 Rand in their bank account. However, 
That bank account was closed on 15 April 2022, three months later. They didn't have 15,000 in their bank account anymore. They now had 15,500 Rand in their bank account. Now, you'll have to put two and two together. How does 15K turn into 15,500? I mean, 15,000 can't be sold for 15,500. So that money was in the bank. So it obviously accumulated interest after date of death. So in my liquidation account, when I put my bank down of money in my FNB account of 15,000 Rand, I put that 15,000 Rand value because that was the amount that was in my bank account as a date of death. The other 500 Rand interest that accrued, accrued after 15 January. So that's going to be for another account. Now, these things might not make perfect sense to all of us at the moment, but when we go through our liquidation account, it's going to start making sense. Okay, so I think let us flip to page two to the actual liquidation account. Now, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the sum when we do a liquidation account is assets minus liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution. That balance available for distribution is what we refer to as the net value. Okay, so we have to start off with our assets. We said we divided assets into three different sub immovable property, movable property, and then claims in favor. So we start off with our first heading, immovable property. If the exam question says that a deceased person had a house somewhere, um, whatever it may be, we know that's obviously an immovable property. Now, every asset we record, we must describe. Ladies and gentlemen, to learn how to describe assets, if we don't know it already, that is purely study work. And if you encounter an asset that you haven't seen before, then just apply your mind and think of the best way you'd be able to describe this particular asset. So when we speak of, of immovable property, four important things must be included in the description. The first thing is the earth, earth number, whatever. The second thing is in what province is this earth? The third thing is what is the title deed number for this property? And the fourth thing is what is the size of this property? So when we describe immovable property, it's earth, province, title deed number, and size of the property. That is the proper way to describe immovable property. It doesn't matter if we're dealing with wills. It can be dealing with anything. That's how we identify immovable property in law. Now, I want us to keep in mind as well, the question you get might not give you the title deed number and the province and the size of the property. Make a note that if the question doesn't give you the full details or full description of the asset, we need to make the description up, right? You need to make it up. Show the marker you know how to describe it. Hence, I say describing assets is study work. If we understand how to describe each and every asset, we will not have a problem. Okay. Now, here's a rule. If I sold an asset for cash, I now have cash. So, I mean, 100,000 Rand remains 100,000 Rand. If I collect 100,000 in the bank account, 100,000 Rand remains 100,000 Rand. Okay. But if I have a vehicle that is standing in my garage, in the deceased person's garage, and I say that vehicle is worth 100,000 Rand, remember, because the vehicle's there, we're going to say awarded. The question that gets asked is how do you know that vehicle's 100,000 Rand? How can you say that immovable property is worth 2 million Rand? You know, you haven't sold it. You don't have the cash. So in other words, if I want to attach a value like we have to do in our liquidation account to assets that have not been sold for cash, I will need to get those assets evaluated, right? So if it was an immovable property, I would need to get an estate agent in to come and value it. If it was a BMW X3, I would need to perhaps go to BMW Motors to get a valuation on it, all right? So every time we award an asset, we need to also say who valued that asset. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see here, I described the asset, and then straight afterwards, I said valued by ABC estate agents. Again, if they don't tell you who valued the asset, you're gonna make it up. Thereafter, I said awarded to. Now, this is where the trick comes in. 
we said you need to award assets that are not cash in our liquidation account. So how do we go about awarding assets that are not cash? Well, the first thing is, ladies and gentlemen, you will need to look at your exam question. I will give you an example. Let us say your exam question says that the deceased person was married in community of property to A and that the deceased person had a will and their only heir was B, um, her daughter, for argument's sake. OK, so if I had to award this house, if there was a marriage in COP and I had one heir, then I would say half to the spouse because of the marriage in community of property and the other half to the heir because the will says so. If the question was intestate and the question said, look, um, you did your intestate calculation and you saw, OK, um, the two brothers and the sister must inherit everything, then I would have awarded it to the two brothers and the sister. So I can't teach you how to award it, um, to be honest with you. Um, but you'll have to interpret your exam question. And I think tomorrow when we look at an example together, we'll be able to maybe get a, bit, a better picture of how we go about awarding it. But the note you can make there is award the asset in terms of the exam question. So look what the will says. Who must get what? If there's no will, what does interstate law say? And then award it in terms of interstate law, depending on the question you get. But always keep in mind, that marriage comes first, hey? So if there is a marriage in community of property, we'll give half to the spouse. The remainder will be given to the heirs, and if it's interstate law, to whoever the heirs are in terms of in. So that is how we go about describing our immovable property. You'll see next to it, um, I put a number one, and on top, perhaps is a good place for me to start with, uh, uh, right on top of the liquidation account, you'll see description, item, calculation, minus and plus. So description speaks for itself. Yeah, we describe our assets. The column next to it says item. Yeah, we just number our assets. You'll see every asset I list, I just number in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so it goes on. Then I created another column for calculation. This column you might not need. That column you don't need to put in for, um, for um, how can I put it? Uh, if, if you don't think you, you want to use it, but I put a calculation column in because perhaps I want to add or plus things and I just use it there in case I need it. And then you'll see there's a minus and a plus column. Everything we minus comes in the minus column, everything we plus in the plus column. So we are plusing assets and we are minusing liabilities and estate duties. You can see under the plus, plus column, I put an X there next to Earth 678 in the plus column. That is where you would put the value of the movable property. Ladies and gentlemen, the exam question will tell you, Earth 678, valued at 2 million. Perhaps that's all the question says. So you would have to write Earth 678, put, say it's item one, put 2 million in the plus column. We're already making marks by doing this. And then we would have had to make up the description of Earth 678, made up who valued it, because remember, the house is not cash. And then we had to award it, award it to in terms of what the question says. Now, the nice thing is, ladies and gentlemen, you will, you will award it the same way every single time. So in my example, I said you are married in community of property and you have one heir. That means half to the spouse and the other half to the heir. So every time we are going to award an asset, we are going to repeat. We are going to say exactly the same thing. So you don't have to learn different ways of awarding it. Just award it in terms of what your question says. If you have to award more than one asset, award it more than one time in the same manner. All right, so it's, it's about it's a bit of repetition. OK, but either way, it doesn't matter what type of immovable property I ask you or the exam question asks you. That is how we deal with it. And you'll get your two or three marks by dealing with it in that manner. OK, if you if you move on. You then move on to movable property. We said we have immovables, movables and claims in favor. Kyle, sorry, are you going to take questions after or can we ask now? Um, I'm going to finish assets and then I'm going to take questions. Okay, thanks. And then I'll finish liabilities and take questions again, you know. So we'll, we'll have two opportunities to deal with questions just on the liquidation account. All right. So 
again, if we if we're going on, remember, I, I cannot see your faces. I do not know if you have questions. I do not know if you understand what I'm saying or not. All I'm doing is trying to explain it the best way I can over Teams. And if if you are unsure of something, make a note, and uh, you know we'll have a, an opportunity to ask questions on it as well. Okay. So we then move on to movable property. Now all I've done here is I've just listed you know basic examples of different types of movables that you might get. Okay. So it doesn't mean what I've said here is exactly what you're gonna get. I've just thumbs up. Okay. So usually you would uh, you would get a vehicle. Okay. So you can see a vehicle, and they might tell you the deceased person has a vehicle, let's say a BMW X3, valued at 150,000 Rand. Maybe that's all the question says. So I would have to write here, vehicle, BMW X3. Now we think, how do I describe a vehicle? Registration number, when we describe vehicle. So you make a registration number up if they don't give it to you. That is good enough for describing vehicles, ladies and gents. So you'll see I put a number two there. And then obviously the little X in the plus column is you put down the value of the vehicle there as per the exam question. But again, this is not cash. So I need to value it and award it. Go back to my description. Underneath registration number, I said they're valued by BMW Motors. Awarded to, well, what does your question say? And my question, I'm going to say again now, half to spouse, the other half to the heir. So it's a bit of a repetition. We just got to get into the habit. If the asset is not cash or turn into cash, Describe it, value it, award it. That is the rule. It does not change for anything. All right. Let's flip the page. Another classic example is furniture. I mean, we, we're trying to think of basic things in a deceased estate, a house, a car, furniture. So the question might say, there's furniture to the value of 50,000 Rand for argument's sake. How do I describe furniture? Now, there is no requirement in law that you now go and list what that furniture uh, consists of. You don't need to say there is a dressing room table, a bed, a couch, a dining room. You know, a, a, you don't need to go into that depth. When you see furniture, easy way to describe it. Look what I said there. Household furniture and effects. If you say that, that is a good enough description. So I put number three there, and then obviously you put the value in the plus column. But again, this is not um, this is not um, cash. So again, I must value it and award it. Now, in practice, ladies and gentlemen, it is very difficult to put a value on furniture, you know, because often a lot of furniture doesn't have much value anymore. The value is more of a sentimental nature. So you'll see when I valued it there, I wrote there per informal valuation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you could have got a company to come and value it for you. Um, that's fine. But, uh, you know, if you said per informal valuation, that's not a problem. In other words, what you're saying, it's an estimated value because it's very difficult to value furniture. Thereafter, again, we will award it the exact same way we awarded the previous two assets. A firearm is the next one. Another typical example. They might say you have a, a, a handgun for argument's sake um, that's, that's there. So I put the firearm, handgun. How do we describe guns? With a serial number. So keep that in mind. Remember, if you see a firearm, the way to describe it is to make up a serial number if they do not give it to you. Again, we value it. I made up the asset valued by Champ Sports, and we award it in the exact same fashion. Do you see we're doing the same thing over and over and over? You know, I look at it and I see easy marks. The only thing that you needed to understand is the awarded to part. And that depends on the exam question. So look at your question. See what the question is telling you who must inherit. Have a look if there's a marriage, right? And you award it in terms of that marriage and what the question is telling you who the beneficiaries are. Okay. Now we go on. You'll see the next one on my fifth item there is coins. So maybe, okay, look, you'll see that it says coins, Krugerrands realized. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if I told you there is Krugerrands there um, to the value of 50,000 Rand, you would have had to award the Krugerrands, okay? But if I told you there are Krugerrands there to the value of 50,000 Rand, but sold for 55,000 Rand, the key thing being sold for. 
Okay, so it's turned into cash. Then after you finish describing your coins, you would have to say realized. So I, I don't want us to ask the question, why did we say awarded to over there? Why did we say realized over there? Keep in mind, in the exam, I don't know if you're going to award this or if you're going to realize. It depends what the question is telling you. I'm just illustrating you the different possibilities that could come forward. So in my mind, I see an exam question that says you have Kruger Rands sold for 55,000 Rand for argument's sake. So how do I describe Kruger Rands? Quite simple. You just say coins, Kruger Rands, description is done. You put the sold for price down by your plus column. And because you sold the coins, it is now regarded as being realized. Remember, asset is turned into cash. Then we realize it. But on the same breath, the exam question didn't have to say you sold those coins. It could have said those coins are still there. And we must understand that if the coins haven't been turned into cash, then I can't say realized. Then I would have had to award it again, the same way I did the above. Similarly with the above, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I awarded the firearm, but maybe the exam question said the firearm was sold for cash. If it said that, then I wouldn't have to value it and award it. Then I would have just said, realized okay so we need to interpret our questions going forward okay those are typical movables that you could look out for now they could give you any type of movable i do not know but apply that principle of describe it value it award it but if it's sold for cash you just describe it and say realized and if it's already cash we just describe it and say collect it so have a look at the next one number six now, this is important to remember. Shares in a company is regarded as movable property. So if the question says the deceased person had shares in a company, we know that that falls under movables. Okay. Now, a private company is particularly important, ladies and gents. It's something you can look out for in an exam because it has a twofold purpose. Um, but I'll come to that purpose a bit later. So let us say, well, let's look at my description here. I said ABC company PTY LTD. Well, the fact that it says PTY LTD tells you it's a private company. I said 50 shares in a private company, and I said registration number. So that's the way we describe companies. Name the company, say how many shares the deceased had in the company, and then obviously, ladies and gentlemen, by now we should know that we identify a company through their registration number. Okay. Now, what's important about private companies is there's a little something extra we have to learn. Okay. Now, you'll see underneath the registration number, I said there, per auditor's valuation approved by chief revenue inspector. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are done describing a private company, you must say per auditor's valuation approved by chief revenue inspector. It's just the rules. Right. So this is a bit different from the other movables we looked at. So this is study work. Remember, if you see a private company, when you're done describing it, you must say that sentence per auditor's valuation approved by chief revenue inspector. Underneath that, you can see I said realized. So if you see realized, we make the assumption that those shares were sold for cash. But we must keep in mind, if the question just said you had 50 shares to the value of let's say 200,000 Rand. Ladies and gents, shares is not cash. A share is a share certificate. So if the question just said you had 50 shares to the value of 200,000 Rand, I would have had to award those shares because it's not cash. So the fact that I've said realized there means that we, the main up question is that those shares were sold for cash. All right. And I, I, I keep repeating this um, and I, I hope I hope we're understanding what I'm saying here. We, we must be able to distinguish between the two when it's awarded or realized. Okay, that was item six, and you obviously put your figure in the plus column. And then there's one more movable that I wrote down here, and yeah, we can see it's DEF company LTD. Now, if you just see LTD, I'm obviously referring to a public company now. Again, it's still a company. So I said there's shares in the public company, and we put a registration number. So we describe it pretty much in the same way we describe a private company. But look underneath registration. It says they per stock broker's valuation. Now, with the private company, we had to learn 
When we're done describing it, we said per auditor's valuation approved by chief revenue inspector. In the same way, a public company, we have to learn. When we are done describing it, we have to say per stockbroker's valuation. That is just study work for a public company, ladies and gents. And over here, you see I said awarded to. Now, again, please do not say, okay, private companies are realized and public companies are awarded. No. It depends what the question is saying. OK, I'm just illustrating to you a company doesn't need to be awarded or it doesn't need to be realized. Interpret your question. Have those shares been sold for cash? If yes, realized. If those shares have not been sold, then we award it because it is not cash. OK, so that is how we deal with movables. And then lastly. We have claims in favor. This is our third different type of asset. Now I can tell you straight up. Usually cash in the estate comes under claims in favor, money that's already there. In other words, things that were collected. So if you see money in a bank account of the deceased person, you'll know that has a home under claims in favor. If you see policies that are paying out into the deceased estate, that has a home under claims in favor. You will see things that were awarded or realized came under immovable or movables, where well, your claims in favor is generally collected. So it doesn't refer to um, assets that are there that we can see or touch. Ladies and gentlemen, please mute. Um, someone is not muted. I think it's Mildred. Mildred Chibangu. We can hear you. There we go. Thank you. All right. So when we see bank accounts, we see policies paying out. We're thinking claims in favor. Another possible claim in favor you could get is, let's say the question said, John down the street owes the deceased 100,000 rand for whatever purpose. That would also be a claim in favor. So money owed to the deceased is a claim in favor as well as bank accounts and policies that pay out into the deceased account. So let's have a look how we deal with it. Let us say the question said you pass away and the deceased had 50,000 Rand in their APSA bank account. OK, so we know that's a claim in favor. So we put the APSA bank. Obviously, we keep itemizing everything. That's number eight. How do we describe a bank? Very easy. Name the bank, name the type of account and name the account number. All right, APSA bank, we made up check account and I made up an account number. By the plus column, I would have put the 50,000 Rand in the bank account and you can see underneath the description, all I said was collected. Why is it collected? Because it is cash, number one. And number two, I didn't have to sell an asset to get the cash. If I sold an asset to get the cash, I would have said realized. If it was not cash, I would have said awarded. But money in a bank account or policies that pay out Money in a bank account or policies that pay out is collected. It's cash that is already there. So we say collected. OK, so that is how we'll deal with the bank. And then you'll see there's two more claims in favor. This deals with policies. Now, before we even look at it, I think it's important we just have a, a quick discussion about policies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the norm is, and I'm referring now specifically to life policies. The norm is that a life policy over your life, when you die, the whole point is that that policy pays out to someone, whether it be to, you know, your family or to your spouse or to your children, whoever you nominated, that life policy pays out to a beneficiary. The moment we see a life policy and there is a named beneficiary, we cannot, cannot include that life policy in our um, in our liquidation account. The reason being, the liquidation account is a list of assets. But if I have a life policy over my life that says when I die, a million rand must be paid to my spouse. When I die, that policy is going to pay a million rand to my spouse. It's not going to pay a million rand into my deceased estate. So I can't include it as an asset. So when you see life policies with a beneficiary, don't touch it. 
it doesn't belong in your liquidation account because it is not the deceased person asset. But there is two possibilities where we could perhaps receive life policies into the deceased estate. If you see a scenario in the exam that says there was a life policy over the deceased, however, there was no beneficiary, meaning there was no one nominated who could receive the life policy. Now, let's think to ourselves. If there is no beneficiary for the life policy to be paid out to, where's that money going to go? They are then going to pay that money into the deceased estate, and that will be divided in terms of marriage, legacies, and heirs, whatever the will says, whatever interstate law says. So when you see a policy over the deceased life, and, you see, and the question says there is no beneficiary, then we can include it in the liquidation account. If you have a look there, I made up a Sunlam life policy. Now, ladies and gents, you, you name the policy, and to describe the policy, we just have to make up a policy number if they don't give it to us. So Sunlam life policy, policy number, whatever, and then you see underneath it, I said no beneficiary. Perhaps another tip to keep in mind, it is not natural for life policies to pay out into a deceased estate. This is not a usual thing. So if we go and just record the Sunlam life policy, policy number so-and-so collect a question is going to be asked why are we putting a life policy of the deceased life that is supposed to pay out to someone else why are we putting this as an asset in the deceased estate so what i'm trying to get to is when you place a policy in the liquidation account just in short say why so you can see underneath there i said no beneficiary that is telling the marker and telling the master's offers that this policy has a home in the liquidation account because the policy had no name beneficiary, right? And then we say collected. As we understand, bank accounts and policies are collected. As you can see, it's a lot easier and quicker to, to describe assets when it's realized or collected. No value and no awarded to has to take place. Then you'll see a third policy. A liberty life policy, this is item 10. Obviously, again, a policy number. And then you see a surrender value, okay? So this is the third different type of policy I wanted to speak to you about. Now, we are talking about policies over the life of the deceased. And if that policy had a beneficiary, it doesn't come in the liquidation account. And if the policy did not have a beneficiary, then it will come in the liquidation account. Study work. But what about life policies over the life of someone else? Let me give you a practical example. Let's say you are married and your husband or wife has a life policy that says if they die, you receive a million rand. Okay, so the life policy is over your life. But what happens if you die first? Okay, so this is when a life policy is not over the life of the deceased, but over the life of someone else that is supposed to pay out to the deceased. But the problem now is that that life policy could never mature. The simple reason is because the deceased died first. The deceased was only supposed to get the money when the other person died. But that person is still alive at the time when the deceased dies. Okay. Now, let me tell you this. In reality, what can simply happen is that person who had the life policy over the, uh, that was supposed to pay out to the deceased, they can just continue the life policy and change their beneficiary, right? If that happens, obviously, it's not going to find a home in the deceased liquidation account. But in the exam, if you see a policy over someone else's life, a life policy over someone else's life, that they're supposed to pay out to the deceased, and they say there, there is a surrender value that pays out to the deceased. So we look for that word surrender value. That means that the person who is alive, who had the life policy, did not, not choose to continue the life policy and change benefits. They choose to close the life policy and have the policy pay out a surrender value into the deceased estate. So that's a certain portion of the policy will then just be paid out to the deceased estate. And the reason why it's doing it is because the person who's, al who's, alive, who's alive decided there is no point in continuing this life policy because I only meant it for the deceased. There's no one else that I can give this to or transfer it to. So I'm going to close the life policy over my life and have 
the policyholder, uh, sorry, the, the, the company that, that's running the policy, in this example, it is Liberty Life Policy, have them pay out a surrender value into the estate of the deceased. The key word being into the estate of the deceased. Anything coming into the estate of the deceased must be regarded as an asset. So then we mention the policy and we say there's surrender value. Surrender value tells the master's office, this was a policy over someone else's life that is now paying into our estate. So we are now including it as an asset in our liquidation account. So we, when it comes to policies, distinguish between is it a policy over the life of the deceased or policy over the life of someone else. If over the life of the deceased, is there a beneficiary? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, don't touch it. If the answer is no, include it, because no beneficiary means it gets paid into the uh, um, liquidation account. If it's a life policy over the life of someone else that is meant to be paid to the deceased when they die, but the deceased unfortunately dies first, have a look at that question says there's a surrender value payout. If it does, we know it finds a home in our liquidation account. So ladies and gents, as far as assets go, all I'm trying to, to illustrate to you is possible different ways and examples you could get it. Right? But obviously, you can't go and study these notes off by heart and think this is how I'm going to answer my exam question because we do not know what's going to come in the exam. Some things that were awarded here might be realized and vice versa ultimately. We just need to understand the illustration of how we go about drafting the liquidation account. You can see underneath claims in favor. I wrote their total assets and I drew two lines with the X there. All we're going to do now is add our removable property, movable property and claims in favor together. And now we get our total asset value. All right. That is how we deal with assets. So I think let's open the floor up for some questions. Jonathan. Jonathan, I'm listening. Uh, so when you are, so when the question in an exam, when the question gives you the value, uh, in your account you've uh, stated who has done the valuation. What do you put there when the question gives you the value? You know. So, so if the question, when you say when the question gives you the value, um, as in the question says the car is valued for hundred thousand rand, for argument's sake. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. yes. Well, then we, we obviously we're going to put the 100,000 Rand down to the value of the car and we're going to describe the vehicle and then we're going to make up who valued it and then we are going to award it. You know, the question might tell you who valued it already, uh, you know, and then we'll just know that instead of making up who valued it, we'll, we'll put down what the question says who valued it. So if the question just gives you a value of, of an asset and doesn't say the asset has been transferred or converted into cash, then we just make use of the value of that asset in our liquidation account. Okay, no. Jonathan, does, does that answer you? Uh, just the last part, you, you uh, the, the first part I understand, you say that although the question gives you the value, you still got to make up somebody that valued it when you are putting the, uh, when you are stating it in your accounts, when you're recording it yes. in your accounts. Um, and then you mentioned something about in the end there. Yeah, so, so, so what I was saying is sometimes the exam question um, will actually tell you in the question that it was valued by these people for argument's sake. Then we'll just copy paste what the exam question says. But often they don't because they want to see you able to make it up and understand how we go about describing, valuing, and awarding assets. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I heard, I heard, I heard Katlejo. Okay, I'll go second then. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to ask um, in regards to the surrender value now. Uh, so personally, I cannot collect. Um, the surrender value, even though I'm not continuing with the policy and the policy, I am the beneficiary. I don't have a right to claim that money. When you say I don't have a right, who are you referring if, to? As if I if I am the beneficiary of the uh, the life policy. Yeah. 
So basically, I cannot, I have to, the, the policy amount, the surrender value is going to go into the, into the estate instead of personally to me. As well, well, well remember, remember the estate is you because you would be dead. So we, we're no, dealing uh, with the deceased person's life. No, I, I meant, um, I don't know how to put it properly. Um, if um, I'm the, I open the policy. Okay. Yes. And I've been paying uh, the policy. All right. All right. Yes. No, no, I hear you. No, no, no. You, you, you can't take your own life policy as such, you know, while you're oh. alive. Yeah. So a surrender value would imply that you cancel the life policy and they're paid out a certain percentage thereof into the intended okay. beneficiary's accounts. Oh, okay. Perfect. Hi, Thank hi you. Yes, go for it. Um, can you please repeat what you said based on uh, with regards to policy over life of the deceased and the policy over the life of someone else, please? Okay, so, so if you have a policy, a life policy over your life, the, the aim of your life policy would be that if you die, you, uh, money must be paid out to a certain beneficiary. Okay, so if you see a scenario where this says there's a life policy over the deceased life, it must be paid out to someone, let's say the wife or husband or kids, or it doesn't matter who, to be honest with you, then we can't touch that policy because that's not an asset for the deceased. That money is going straight into the estate of someone else. So we leave it alone in our liquidation account. But perhaps the question says there was a life policy over the life of the deceased, but there is no beneficiary. In other words, there's no one to pay this money out to. What will then happen is that policy will then fall back into the deceased estate. Then we'll include it in our liquidation account. So when it speaks of policies over the life of the deceased, just make a distinction if there's a beneficiary or not. If there's a beneficiary, we don't touch it. If there's no beneficiary, it will fall into our deceased estate and we can include it. The third scenario was not about life policies over the life of the deceased. It was about life policies over the life of someone else that was supposed to be paid to the deceased. Now, in order for that policy to mature, that person had to die and the deceased then had to get the money. But the problem is the deceased person died first. The other one is still alive. Then what can happen is that person who's still alive can cancel their life policy because it has no purpose anymore. And then the money from that policy that policy or power, what we call a surrender value, into the estate of the deceased person. So if you see a scenario with a life policy over the life of someone else, and it says that there's a surrender value that pays out to the deceased estate, then we include that surrender value in our liquidation account under claims in favor. Adele, yeah, Cole? Yeah, I heard Adele. And Cherie. I heard Adele, Cherie's Zama, so we'll go in that order. And um, Shane, please. Adele, you can proceed. Okay, um, I just want to find out, um, so basically, if it's a marriage in community of property, the full value of the the asset, the, the immovable asset, will be put into the L liquidation account. But if it's out of community of property, will it only be half? And what about the other assets? Do you also then deduct half for all of those if it's out of community of property? And then what would you do if it's a, a massed estate? And um, I just missed the part about the interstate, if it's interstate. Okay, so, so let's deal with marriage first, okay? So let's deal with out of community of property. If we are out of community of property, it means you have your estate and I have my estate. So whatever I record there is, is my, is my um, things that I have ownership over. So I record the full value. Let us say we're married in community of property. It means whatever I'm recording over here, technically by law, you own half because we share the same estate. It does not mean we must have it we still put the full value of the asset down. In our other accounts, we will give the half away to our spouse. But for purposes of the liquidation account, we put the full value of the asset down. It doesn't matter if we married in or out of community of property. That's not going to change anything. 
And then, uh, look, I did an example where I said the person was married in community of property and there was an heir. But the example or the question in the exam could easily have been an intestate scenario, you know, where they would have uh, said someone died without a will. And they would have told you they left behind a son, a daughter, a spouse, or a parent, or whatever the case may be. If it's an interstate law question, then what you have to do is you have to do your interstate law calculation that we looked at yesterday, okay? And determine what is there to be given in terms of marriage, and determine who are the heirs, who are the beneficiaries. And then when, I, when you come to the awarded to part in the liquidation account, you award it in terms of what interstate law says you must award it. So you'll have to just, you know, do your calculation quickly and see who gets what, and we award it in that fashion. So let's say you calculated and you picked up the spouse and two kids must receive the inheritance in equal shares, for argument's sake. Then you, you would have said awarded one-third to spouse, awarded one-third to the one kid, awarded one-third to the other kid. So, yeah, you would have to look at your question, interpret who gets what, and then you award it in that fashion. Does that answer you, Adele? Um, yes, and what about massing? Now, massing is complicated because massing implies if, if, if I pass away, again, we have a joint estate as such, so I will still record the full value of the assets, but what would have to do then when we award it? If it's massing, we can only award it to the beneficiary because remember the whole rule was that the, upon the death of the first dying, all the assets go to the nominated beneficiary. So my surviving spouse wouldn't get ownership of anything. The beneficiary nominated, for argument's sake, our child, that child would be awarded everything. So in massing, you award it to the nominated beneficiary. Hi, could you please ask Kwanele to switch off the video? Um, sorry, Kwanele. Oh, there we go. Adult, did I answer you? Yes, we just had these two questions were in um, last year's uh, two papers and it, it, um, with the massing and with the interstate and that completely threw me. So <laughs> Yeah, look, to be honest, if you get a question on massing, you know, that's quite unlucky because that's not a everyday type of thing. But just remember, if, if there is massing involved, remember the rules that the beneficiary then takes ownership over everything. Okay. Thanks. All right. I think we had a th Hi, and Kyle. Or something like that. <laughs> Hi, Kyle. Sorry. So I have a scenario. Um, if the deceased is the owner of a house uh, valued at 5 million uh, rand per se, and he uh, leases this house out for five years, and um, the rental is uh, per annum, um, payable six months in advance, um, and he passes away while the lease is still in play. What? How do you calculate it, or how do you record it in the LND account? Okay, so first of all, uh, if you pass away, that lease agreement continues. So let's say you pass away January. Yeah. February, March, April carries on going, and there's lease money coming in, rental money coming in. Mm -hmm. But this is money that is coming in after date of death of the deceased person. So I can't record that money in my liquidation account because it's money being made after I pass away. So that would find a home in our income and expenditure account. So in the liquidation account, I would focus on when the day I die, what is the value of the property I own? If it's 500,000 Rand, I'm putting 500,000 Rand in my liquidation account. The rental income coming in after date of death is exactly that. It is not for my liquidation account, it is for my income and expenditure account. Okay, cool. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Zana, uh, Hi, Kyle. Saw so here. Go for it. Uh, Kyle, I would like to understand about the divestment note. Yes. Uh, which one is it uh, from the recordings that we have done so far? Is it the part where we say awarded to? Correct. Correct. It's, it, look, it's either awarded to or it's realized or collected, eh? Well, okay, thank you. Perfect. Janine. Janine, go for it. Hi, Carl. Um, so my question, um, all right. So you have stipulated that 
any anything that is policy related must be reflected under the um, claims in favor of the estates section. Now, I, I've obviously we have a content here in our study guide, and in their notes, they've reflected it in the movable property um, section. So, for the sake or brevity of exams. What would be the correct section or most correct section to put policies under? Because claims in favour. Claims in favour, most definitely. I've okay. never personally encountered an LD that went to the master's office with a policy reflected under movables. Claims in oh. favour. You know, I, I, look, if your book says under movables, then I suppose they can't mark you wrong, eh? But from a from, from a practical perspective, I've never encountered a, a policy being placed under movables. Uh, sorry, Carl, in addition to that, I just want to ask something quickly. Uh, from the memos, the past exam paper memos, uh, they are uh, immovables, movables, then cash and assets reduced to cash. Is it correct to put it that way? No, cash and assets reduced to cash is something we're going to use in our recapitulation account. But if you listen to that term, cash and assets reduced to cash, cash refers to collected. Assets reduced to cash refers to assets sold for cash. In other words, realized, you know. So, so I'd say stick to the terms of awarded, realized, and collected because that saying of cash, assets, and assets reduced to cash, we are going to use in one of our other accounts that we're still going to get to. Thank you. Azama. But what I want to try to get to there, ma'am, as well, if, if you said um, uh, cash, asset, re uh, reduced to cash, an asset reduced to cash. What do you actually say? You're saying um, real, it's, you're it's, saying it's, realized. Yes, it's 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 arranged this way. It's immovable property, right? Value valued at this amount, then movables valued at this amount, uh, which is awarded, right? Then cash and assets reduced to cash that is realized and collected. Correct. That is the same that you are going to post into the recapitulation account. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Zama, you were next. Zama. Yes. Um, you in the uh, just went through your first set of notes for LND account, the one that has a question. Under the assets, you put your policy for surrender value for six hundred, and then you indicate there's still ten thousand unpaid premiums. It's still under asset. Will it not be going under liabilities because it still has to be paid? Okay, well, you're jumping a bit ahead, Zama. We'll discuss that <laughs> tomorrow. But, 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 but okay. I can tell you, you're correct. And the question, the, the reality is, in an exam, you'll have assets and liabilities, but you might find under your assets certain things that are also liabilities. So, mm. what you, what you'll, as you pick it up there, you picked up a liability under assets, which is quite correct. When we look for liabilities, we've got to look by the assets and by liabilities, because sometimes an asset, gives you an asset, but it says there after that you also owe money on that asset. And we know if we owe money, that's a creditor, that's a liability. So yeah, you, you're on the right track with your thought process there, but we'll, we'll look at that uh, tomorrow as such. Okay, thank you. Right. Nadia. Two Lama. More, Missy. We'll do two more questions. Lama. Nadia. Lama, go for it. Uh, so Karen, I wanted to ask, uh, I didn't quite get a part where maybe uh, the asset, probably a house, uh, belongs to two people and they're not married. So say the deceased uh, owns half. So how do you deal with it in the in the L and account? If remember, in the liquidation account itself, we're just listing the full value of the assets. When we need to give something away to a person because they own half, for argument's sake, we will sort that out in our distribution account. So we'll still come to that. I mean, for example, if, if I have a house for a but my spouse owns half of it, I put a million rand down in my liquidation account. But in my distribution account, I'm going to go give half of that away. Right? So we, that, that's the purpose. We put the full value down. We sort out what we owe the other person in our distribution account. Oh, OK, thank you. OK. Nadia. Nadia, go for it. Ladies and gents, this is final question. And we're going to look at liabilities. And I'll open the floor up again for questions. So if you miss out now, you'll have your chance now again. So Nadia, go for it. 
Great. Um, I have two questions. The first question being, um, I think it's rather silly, but I think I need clarity. So say, for instance, um, our deceased has loads of shares in both private and public companies. Do we first list the private companies and then the public companies, or do we mix them up? Or how exactly do we list it? Does one take preference over the other in terms of listing it? So there is no order to the way we list it. As long as you put it under the correct subheading, you could have listed it in any way you wanted. There's, there's no specific order. Okay, great. And my second question is, say, for instance, um, a husband and wife, um, basically, let's just say, for instance, the wife takes a life policy that if she were to die, then her husband would benefit from it. It just so happens that she dies, for instance, on the 1st of April, and then her husband dies on the 2nd of April. Um, and obviously, because she took a life policy and naming him the beneficiary, um, I'm assuming that all of that will then transfer into his estate. Um, does that then fall under the liquidation account? Do we include that in the liquidation account? Okay, so, so if we look at it practically, when she died on 1 April, that yes. life policy effectively kicked in in the sense that it must now pay out to the spouse, to her husband, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure by the 2nd of April, it has not paid out. Obviously, it takes some time, okay? But the point is, it is a claim due to her husband. He then okay. dies on the 2nd of April. So meaning his deceased estate will have this policy paying into it as a claim in favor, you know. But the wife's deceased estate will have nothing to do with this policy because it had a name beneficiary when she died. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And just for clarity, one last time, um, the only time we actually do put a policy in our liquidation account is if there's no beneficiary and if it has a surrender value. That's it. That, that's what to look out for. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Cool. All right. Ladies and gents, we'll come back to questions now, now again. Let's just move on. You'll see as far as the liquidation account goes, the assets is it's the most complicated in the sense that, that. it's it, it quite a bit study work. Sorry, Kyle. Right. Can, can, can Vongani please switch off uh, the camera? And almost all of us guys, we need to ensure that we switch off the cameras and mics. It's, it's very disturbing. All right, ladies and gents, if if, uh, if we can all just switch our cameras off, um, I, I know from past lectures that for some other reason, the, the, the volume seems to be a bit better when our cameras are off as well. All right, thank you. All right. So the total assets took us the longest because there was a process. Eh? We had to describe it. We had to value it. We had to decide if we are awarding it or realizing or collecting it. When it comes to liabilities, this is a much more easier process. So you'll see underneath total assets, I put my next subheading, or my next heading, which is liabilities. Remember, we have to minus liabilities from our total assets. So if you switch to the next page, assets, we have three different types, immovables, movables, claims, and favor. When it comes to liabilities, you have two different types. You have administrative expenses and you have creditors, all right? Those are your two different types of liabilities. Now, admin expenses, and please make your notes if you think you're going to forget. Admin expenses is the natural um, and unavoidable expenses incurred when winding up a deceased estate. I'm going to say that again. Administrative expenses is the natural and unavoidable expenses incurred when winding up a deceased estate. It means, in other words, that everyone who passes away will have administrative expenses, some more than others. You will see underneath administrative expenses, I listed a couple examples. Now, let's think to ourselves. Yesterday, we learned how to wind up a deceased estate. One of those steps was to open up a deceased estate bank account. So all of us has bank accounts. And there's bank charges, meaning the deceased estate is going to pay bank charges. One of the other steps, or two of the other steps, was we had to do a Section 29 advert and a Section 35 advert. Now, those advertisements are not for free in the newspaper, um, ladies and gents. So the deceased estate is paying for those advertisements as well. Let us think, when Nana, when we're going through our examples, we spoke of immovable property, that if whatever it was, six two, six seven eight, And we spoke of the uh, BMW X3. We spoke of the furniture 
We spoke of the firearm. I'm, I'm referring to all the things we awarded. The moment we awarded it, you saw above awarding it, someone valued it for us. And ladies and gentlemen, someone is not going to come and value your house for free. That estate agent charges you. So in other words, the estate had to pay valuation costs. Look at the next two, transfer costs and conveyancing costs. That immovable property, Earth 678, that property had to be transferred in someone else's name. The deceased estate pays for the transfer and conveyancing costs. You see, these are costs we can't escape. It's, it's natural expenses. Executor's fees, master's fees. The estate must pay the executor 3.5% of the total assets. These are things the estate cannot escape. If we move on there, you'll see there is postage and petties, commission costs. I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of the term postage and petties, normal office expenses, you know, copies of paper and things we had to incur in winding up this estate. Commission costs, that's something to look out for as well. If you got a scenario where they said the deceased person had, let's say, a dining room table, okay, and no one in the deceased estate actually wanted their dining room table, and it wasn't worth too much. So the executive decided, well, I've got someone who will buy this dining room table for 2,000 rand. So let me sell the dining room table so I can get 2,000 rand at least into the deceased estate. Now we must think, this executor is selling the dining room table so that we can get money into the deceased estate. So he is selling the table for the purposes of winding up the deceased estate. So he then employed X to go and sell that table for him for 2,000 bucks. X sold the table for him, but X says he wants his commission paid. He may be charged 200 rand. Commission as in payment we give to someone for selling something for us. So now we've paid X 200 rand for selling that table for us. The fact that we paid X 200 rand for selling that table for us is an unavoidable cost. It was a cost the estate paid so that we could sell an asset and turn it into cash. So commission costs, if you see commission in the question, commission payable to whoever. Keep in mind, that's not a creditor. That's an admin expense. It's an expense incurred in winding up the deceased estate. Now, if you have a look then, from bank charges to commission, I think it's quite obvious that everyone will have different admin expenses. Some might only have three or four. Some might have 15. You know, it depends on your scenario. So usually for exam purposes, what they could do, I'm not too sure how you're going to get it, but, you know, we all can't go and make up how much the bank charges is, how much the advert costs is, how much the valuation costs is. If we all made that up, we're all going to get different answers, meaning everyone's L&D is going to have a different answer. So usually they just give the admin expenses to you in the exam. I do not know if they're going to do it. I use the word usually. And the point is that if they don't give the admin expenses to you, then, you know, we're all going to have different answers, which is going to be a problem. So they might give the admin expenses to you, but tell you to also go and add one or two or three other admin expenses possibly. Or they might say, well, your admin expenses is 300,000 rand. Just show the different type of admin expenses. So they want you to put 300,000 rand by admin expenses and then just list underneath it possible admin expenses that the deceased estate could have had. I do not know how they're going to ask it, but as long as we understand what ad admin expenses are, we won't have a problem there too. Okay. The second type of liability we said is creditors. Now, creditors, ladies and gents, if you recall, we did our section 29 advertisement. All right. Now, this section 29 advertisement was that um, newspaper advert and gazette advert where we called on creditors to come and lodge their claim against the deceased estate. Not less than 30 days, not more than three months. All those creditors who lodged their claim, that's where we put them. I mean, I just made it up a couple examples here. As you can see, it's, it's a lot more, a lot more easier um, to, um, to list creditors than it is to do assets. You know, with the assets we have to describe and value and award or realize and collect, with creditors, we literally just name the creditor and put the value down. As you can see, we are putting all the values down in our minus column now because we're minusing liabilities. 
So I made it up. I said, we owe Vodacom money. I don't know how much the exam question will tell you. We owe Edgar's money. We owe Swane municipality money. We owe F&B on our bond money. You know, possibly they told you, you know, you have that earth 678 valued at 2 million, but you owe 500,000 rand on the bond. So we would have had a 2 million rand asset and a 500,000 rand creditor. Right? So we always fully disclose our asset and we fully disclose our liability. But as you can see, it's a lot easier with creditors. You just name the, the creditor, put down the figure the exam question is telling you how much we owe to these people. When you're done, you'll see we add up our liabilities. We have total liabilities. Now, this is where I need us to concentrate. Our sum so far reads total assets minus total liabilities. We have our total asset figure and we have our total liability figure. But if you recall, the liquidation account consists of what? Total assets minus total liabilities minus estate duty. And that is going to give us our balance available for distribution. So underneath total liabilities, you see I, I wrote the estate duty. And underneath that, I wrote the balance available for distribution. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, at this stage, I cannot get my balance available for distribution. In other words, I cannot get my net value because I do not know what my estate duty was. So in other words, I must go and do my estate duty account. That is the second account we're going to go and do. I must go and do that account, get the answer there, bring that answer back into my liquidation account and place it by estate duty. Then I go total assets minus total liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution. Now, just to explain, Estate duty is sort of like a, uh, I refer to it as a tax after death. So if your estate is large enough, you may owe money, taxable money on your estate as well. So estate duty is another liability, another form of liability, if I may say so. All right. But the problem is it's its own account. It's our second account we must look at. So I complete my liquidation account but I leave open estate duty and I leave open balance available for distribution. I then go and do my estate duty account. Figure out, do the formula, figure out how much I owe. Perhaps I owe nothing. Nevertheless, I go and I put my figure down by estate duty in my liquidation account. And now I will go assets minus liabilities minus estate duty. And I get my balance available for distribution. All right. That is how we attend to our liquidation account. Let me again open the floor for questions. Jonathan. Jonathan, go for it. Uh, in your admin expenses, your executive fees, that we said is basically 3.5%. Uh, is that the 3.5% of your working out of that asset above it, the assets above it? The, the total assets above it, yes. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Naira here. Hello. Naira, go. Yes. Um, does funeral expenses that have to be paid, if it has to be paid out of the state, um, uh, go under admin expenses? Actually, funeral expenses, strangely enough, falls under creditors. So if the estate claims funeral expenses, it is regarded as a creditor. You know, because I think the reason being is because not every estate claims funeral expenses. So they, they don't want to place it either admin expenses because it's not a definite or guaranteed expense. So it would find a home under creditors. Tali, um, someone, I think it's... Someone is on is not on mute. We can hear your conversation. Sebastian. Radzilani, I believe. There we go. Okay, ma'am, I heard you. Hi, yes, I'm listening. I want to ask on master's fees. Yes. Is there a ceiling, like a maximum amount, if it exceeds like seven thousand? Yes, yes, it is capped. It is capped at seven thousand. Okay, so if estates are between 250 and 400, that's uh, 600 uh, rand. Then if it's more than that, uh, we do the equation. Then if it's more than 7,000, we, we use the maximum. 
That's correct. So you follow the equation in your study guides. It sets out quite nicely there. But if your answer is above 7,000, we know we cap it at 7,000. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Yes, name please. Yes. Um, can you please explain the estate duty again? Well, okay. Well, look, we, we still got to look at the estate duty account, eh? So I haven't okay. explained it yet. But the point uh, is what I have said is the estate duty is a separate account. It is our next account we've got to do. So we've got to do that account, get the answer for estate duty, and then come and put it in our liquidation account. Because at this stage, I cannot fill in the figure by estate duty because I do not know what it is. I'll have to go do that account first. Fill the answer in here. Then I can go assets minus liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution. Okay, thank you. Cool. I got it. Zama. Zama, ladies and gents, just to uh, just to oh. repeat, um, I, I'm I'm picking up names. Eh? So if you say your name, then I, then I remember it, and you you go for your question. So I heard Zama now. Yes, thank you, Carl. Um, just a question. Um, let's say for argument's sake, uh, the deceased was paying, a spousal maintenance or something. And then there is money that is still owed. Does it go under creditors or we put it, where do we put it exactly? Maintenance right, so any, that is owed to the other spouse, yes. Any maintenance you owe to anyone is regarded as a creditor, right? So it would find its home under okay. credit. Perfect. Under creditors, okay, thank you. Yes. So you see, maintenance is ranked above. Marriage legatees and heirs, hey, eh? because liabilities are ranked above everything. So yeah, maintenance uh, is up there with the creditors. Vuyo. Vuyo, listening. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, what happens in a case where the deceased has selected their heir as the executor? Do they pay themselves the three point five percent fee, or what happens then? Yeah, well, indeed, there's often people who are have, have letters of executorships or letters of authorities as such that are heirs as such. And they will, if winding up the state, they are entitled to their 3.5% most definitely. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Tabu. Hi, Kat. Uh, Namsa. I heard, a, I think it was, a, a, could have been a, a Tabu and then a Namsa. I could have heard yeah. wrong. Yes, it's go me. for it. It's Sabu. All right, there we go. Find out. Thank you for, for the opportunity. I just want to find I've got two questions actually. I, I want to find out in there, there was someone who asked about must um, estate. There, mm. if there is, there is a user fraud, how do we deal with that under assets? Well, you see, that's the thing. You need to, what's the value of the user fraud? You know, because the thing is, if you as a deceased person had an asset, but there was a use of fruct over your asset, it would change the value of that asset. So, so you would need to minus the value of the use of fruct from your asset in order to get your actual asset value as such. So use of fruct, you know, is not something that I really ever see in exams, to be honest with you in the past. But what you need to understand about it is if you see a use of fruct over an asset, that use of fraud is going to diminish the value of that particular asset. So you'll have to determine what is the value of that use of fraud and then minus that from the asset and then uh, record that value as such. Oh, OK, thank you, Kyle. And then my second question is on the, the other question that was asked, <clears throat> sorry, about the rental. If they say the rental for the for, for 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 the year or even for six months is payable in advance, and then uh, let's say the the lease starts from January, and then the 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 the, the person dies, the owner of the property dies in um, in March, and there was rental that was paid already in January. How do you deal with that? So if the money is in your account, it means it's there already. So it's at date of death value. Uh, the only time you deal with rental um, that accumulates after date of death is if that's literally money, lease or rental agreement money being paid after date of death. 
But let's say they paid you 120,000 rand for the year uh, in January and you die in March. The fact is when you died, you already had 120,000 rand in your account. So we would include that in our liquidation account. Rental that comes in our income and expenditure is physical rental money being paid to the deceased estate after date of death. So if it's paid in advance, it's already there and we can include it in the liquidation account. Okay, thank you, Khan. Perfect. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Can I go, Nomsa? No, do me. Oh, oh sorry. I heard uh, Nom de Miso and Nomsa, I think. Oh, my tongue, Okay, just a short time ago, I was up. Uh, I, I will work my dung back. <laughs> All right. In the Miso and Namsa, go for it. Okay, who first? Because I was after the person that just spoke. Uh, you'll both like get that? your chance, so it doesn't okay. matter. All right, let me go, Buisa, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Kyle, I have a, I have two questions. First question is around your videos i haven't seen the first and the second videos and i'm not so sure if today not necessarily video the recording if today's session is going to be um shared i would like to request that we get uh, zukiswa to help us with the with the sessions and um, the links so that we can just listen to the recordings that is my first my Second question is around um, calculations in the exam. I'm not, I know that you don't have the exam paper, Kyle, but I just want to find out in terms of the calculations around the, 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 the executor's fees and the master's fees. Uh, did it ever happen that we are required to calculate that? Thank you. All right, so first of all, uh, yeah, all the evening's lectures have been recorded. They will be made available. Um, I'll chat to uh, Zukiswa about that as well. But yeah, that is the intention that uh, it, they all be made available. Um, regarding the calculation, yes, it can happen that they ask you to calculate it. And you will note from your columns, you'll see there's a calculation column there. So if I had to ask you to calculate the executive's fees, you would say 3.5% of your total asset value. And, and perhaps show the, show the marker, because the reality is that you might have got your total assets wrong. Now, if your total assets are wrong, then the problem you have is that your executive's fees is going to be wrong automatically. But if you show, I'm taking 3.5% of this figure, and that figure is your total asset figure, then at least we can see that you are doing it correctly. It's just unfortunate that your total assets is wrong and you could still be positively marked for that. So if you are using other figures in order to calculate an answer, use that calculation column, show the marker what figures you are using. And um, you know it can sort of prevent any negative marking as such. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Anila? Present. All right, I heard Anela and I heard Razan. So let's do it in that order. Okay, Hi. Kyle, it's not. Kyle, if uh, in a case where the spouse is the executor and they uh, submit everything and then they keep the other as in the dark in terms of a uh, development with regards to the distribution of the estate, you. What is what are the time limits uh, for the distribution? All and if the other heirs are kept in the dark, they do not know anything. What what would be the best uh, way to actually address that? So, especially, so the case whereby, especially in a case whereby the executor is the is a relative or a family member. Mm. Yeah, you see, this is a common problem, especially when family members are involved. That's why it's always a safer option to make the executor a separate professional person, because that separate professional person's only interest lies in money they make upon completion of winding up the estate. But nevertheless, I mean, we all encounter situations like that. So sort of the rule of thumb is, 
from the day you get your uh, letter of executorship, you have about six months to draft your l and account. So remember the steps we looked at yesterday. That step, whatever it is in your book, I know they were speaking about 13 steps yesterday. Look what step is your liquidation distribution account. Because the rule is that after six months, you must have done your liquidation and distribution account by then. Now, I do understand that the master's office doesn't always keep proper tabs on that. So what you can do is refer to how long ago the estate was. Let's say it, it, uh, the person uh, passed away a year ago, and a year later you still have no answers. Then write to the master's office, lodge a complaint. Say, I refer to this estate, this person's executor. It's been a year since death. We have, we're left in the dark, and we are actually lodging a complaint against the executor. The master's office then has a duty to notify the executor. An executor must respond and give an updated, detailed position of currently what's happening on the deceased state. Otherwise, that executor can be removed from their powers by the master's office. So your best option is to communicate with the master's office in this regard. And, I mean, if it's been more than six months, well, let's make it a, close to a year because or nine months because they have to get their letter of executorship first. So if it's been more than that, then you definitely have grounds to start approaching the master's office and lodging complaints. Thank you. Gideon. Okay, okay. hold on. I had Razan and then I had Gideon. These will be the last two, and then we're just going to take a little break, ladies and gents. Uh, Razan, go first. Okay, hi, Kyle. Um, I have a question on estate duty. In previous exam papers, they make estate duty zero and then they do an estate duty addendum. Is it also correct if we do it like that? So, so an estate duty account is an estate duty addendum. And the fact that it's zero mean it just meant that there was no estate duty payable. You'll see when we do the estate duty account, which is the same as the addendum. Um, in order, before you start becoming liable to pay estate duty, you need quite a large asset value in your estate. So majority of people, I mean, I would say 95% of people, 10 to 1, or 90% of people probably don't pay estate duty at all. But there is some with very big estates that will qualify to pay. Okay, thank you so much. Cool. Gideon? Thank you, Carl. Uh, just coming back to one of the previous speakers on the heirs not being satisfied with the way in which... Uh, the start, uh, accounts are being dealt with. Uh, surely the executor can then rely on the advert uh, period uh, to justify his actions. Uh, would that be a successful defense at the end of the day? Thank you. Sorry, you said to rely on the on the what period, Fido? The advert period. Uh, yeah. When the, the account lies open for inspection. And there were no claims coming from these heirs that appeared not to be satisfied with the way in which some of these uh, claims were dealt with. Yes, most definitely. I mean, there is outside of that, there is a number of reasons we could rely on. But, uh, you know, I think the point is that we just want to get an idea of where we act in the process because executors love to leave people in the dark about what's going on with the deceased estate. So the executor, in most instances, are able to quite easily explain a delay or what they're waiting for or how far they are in a process and justify all the steps they've been taken and justify how long it's been taken. Uh, you know, th that is not usually a problem. But, uh, you know, like I said, I, I think uh, what was more important there was, you know, is by justifying what they're doing, you are reporting to the master where you are in the process, and the master is then able to convey to the other people where they, um, where the executor currently is in the process, just so that everyone has an understanding of what's currently going on. But to to respond to your statement or slash question, most definitely you could justify it in that manner. Thank you. All right, ladies and gents. Okay. I see if just a quick question before we go. Zama. Uh, sorry. Uh, Zama, very quick one. Go for it. A quick one just before we go. Uh, let's say um, heir or legacy uh, declines, repudiates the benefit. Do you put it back or you've done your L&D, you've indicated property, so and so is going to so, but then they say, no, I'm not taking the house. Do you put the amount back into assets 
or do you uh, put it under the distribution account? Where do you put this after you've drafted your L and D and everything? And they say, yeah, no, I'm not say, taking it. Yeah, you would have to by your distribution account indicate that that the house falls to someone else then and no longer to that person. And you'll have to indicate, make a note in your distribution account that X repudiated the claim, in other words. Therefore, it's falling mm. to Y, for argument's sake. So, yeah, the distribution account is usually where you can sort that out. If there is no Y, do you put it back in so that it can be distributed amongst everyone? Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Amongst the heirs, eh? Yes. Perfect. All right. Ladies and gents, it's 10 past 7. Um, I believe a 10-minute break is in order. Um, let's return at 20 past 7. Uh, see you now now.